Next one, <coughs> REST Labs, set this broker architecture for remote labs, and present by Frederick. started looking at um, designing a new architecture, we had a number of mind, uh, things in mind. One was, um, how could we run the application, uh, the, the, the remote lab, entirely in the browser? Um, no add-ons, no extra code to load down, no modifications whatsoever. Um, is it possible? What would it look like? The second question was, um, can we actually run the experiment um, in a workflow? So I've been doing some work with um, Taverna, which is a workflow engine, and um, we said, wouldn't it be great if we could plug our experiment into it? It took an awful lot of work to pull the experiment apart. Um, it was written in MIT iLabs. It was a lot of work to pull it apart to get it to work in a workflow. And by putting out a workflow, what I mean was we could kick off the experiment and pipe the results of the experiment into a statistics package, which would then do an analysis and spit out some pretty graphics. Um, and that allowed other people to analyze the data in different ways that we, we had with our original experiment. And the third one was um, Node.js just got released. And we said, you know, what would it take to write the entire system in JavaScript? We've done a lot of work with remote, uh, with um, iLabs, MIT iLabs, and finding programmers for C Sharp for web services at our institution was impossible. Um, so we said, well, you know, what if we use JavaScript? I'd be lying if I didn't say we just tended to have a lot of fun. What would happen if we played with all this technology? What would come out of it? So if I just explain a little bit about the background of the iLabs and, and what happened, what led to the decisions. If you look at the iLabs architecture, there's two parts. There's the service broker and the lab server. The lab server runs the experiment. The service broker handles all the administration. So you enter at the arrow, you log into the website, you um, choose the experiment you wish to run. Uh, you then get given a script to run that experiment out of the server. You execute that. Uh, sometime later, maybe your results will turn up and you go back to the lab server and extract them. That means we can't put this into a workflow. I couldn't choose this. I had to go here manually log in to be able to get access to this. If, um, and this was the batch architecture. If you look at the uh, interactive architecture, they'd gone more down the uh, service-oriented ar uh, architecture. They'd started pulling out the storage service and made it um, separate. They pulled out a scheduling system which allowed us to do um, interactive um, experiments. But if you drop that out and just use this, it would allow us to control at a macro level access to our lab server, something we couldn't do before. Um, and we could pull out the experiment as a separate process, and this became some sort of coordinator and administrator for that. It still requires us to enter at this point to log into the service broker um, to find out what experiments or to be granted access to the experiments I want. <coughs> oh, okay. Um, at Rest Labs, we looked at it the other way around. In long discussions with John, we said, what would happen if we entered at the lab server? And said to the lab server, I want to run you. I want to run this particular experiment on you. What would we do then? Well, then we could ask the lab server to say, what's the associated um, uh, service broker that this student has um, an account on? And we can redirect the request to that service broker and says, somebody's asked to run me. Um, they say they've got an account on you. Are they authorized to do it? Um, and then go through the normal process, <coughs> which would be to uh, be granted access to a place to put the data when you're finished, to find out if there's a slot available for this particular service broker, uh, to find out, sorry, to find out if there's a slot for this particular service broker on this machine, 
a, a large slot, <coughs> or to find out if there's a slot within that large slot according to the policies laid down here that would allow me access to the experiment. Um, so we look at the implementation of the MIT. It, it used web services, which at the time it was developed, um, were still being developed. So parts of the web services were available, things like the security services weren't. It was implemented in SOAP, <coughs> Object Application Protocol, uh, and XML, new at the time. It was C-sharp on Windows for uh, reasons of convenience, and as the service broker wasn't a service. It was a um, website one logged into to get access to some services. So what did we do new? Um, we wrote everything we are writing. This is not past tense. We are writing everything in JavaScript um, as opposed to C Sharp. I've got programmers writing that that are raw students that they can't understand um, <coughs> lots of what they're doing. The code they're writing, instead of thousands of lines, text to fit on two to three pages for the same level of functionality. Um, the architecture we're using is RESTful. It's, um, it's not a remote procedure call. Um, it's more contemporary, it's simple, it's lightweight, and allows us to compose systems together very quickly. We drop the data exchange from, JSON, uh, from XML to JSON. JSON is related to the JavaScript, obviously. We don't have to do lots of heavyweight parsing of the, um, of the data. It allows us uh, a lot faster execution. The other advantage of choosing JavaScript here is the implementation is no, no JS, and so it's a um, it's an event-based system. So we have no threads. There's a single thread. The code executes extremely fast, and we're supporting large numbers of clients. The clients, the rule is you write in HTML, um, five CSS and JavaScript. And at this stage, we're restricting that to nothing else. Um, <coughs> The same could apply to um, what was done previously, but we're pushing it to the limit, saying JavaScript is the language, what's the performance going to look like at the other end? And then recently, with John's work, we've started looking at if we build a RESTful service, one particular URL from that service can point to a description of the service. And John outlined the advantages of that in, um, in service discovery and composing services in building code on the fly from a description of what you want, not specifying um, how to go about it. And where are we now? <coughs> um, we've got a lab server prototypes, and, and John indicated some of it. We've actually got a number of different students have taken it different ways, and we've been trying to uh, drive it towards a common place. We've got um, scheduling, so a, 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 a reservation, a booking system and a reservation system, if you like. Um, running, up and running. The um, interesting constraint we put on that was that um, as the viewing system into that, you have to use Google Calendar. And so uh, we have, we've avoided all of that. So we've already done service composition. We're using Google services to do things we're not interested in, particularly writing code for. Um, we've got a storage server up and running. And the um, constraint was that I didn't want to have disk space consumed. How would it um, look? if we use Dropbox as the first example of where we might put the data. The service broker kernel is still in a, a, a mashed up state. Um, we have a project on which all of this is, is to be deployed. It's a um, photonics experiment. And so there is pressure for us to finish this fairly soon. The authorization, um, for those that know John, his background is in network security as well. So we have avoided authorization and authentication until the last possible minute. We want the functionality first. We'll work out later how to go about doing that <coughs> authorization. Uh, so this will be released sometime uh, next year. We'll be testing over this year. And um, you won't hear the full details until 2014. Thanks.